Hello YouTube, Devin here again. Sorry it's been a few days since I made a video. My roommate just kind of doesn't have a life so he just lays around and sleeps and shit. And because I'm a nice guy, I let him sleep for like 20 hours a day. So I'll do a couple videos here today. And the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to redo my, my Adrian Helmet one which was requested because uh, there was a lot of information uh, that was missed and uh, I didn't uh, think it was up to par. So I'm gonna I'm gonna redo it. So I pulled that one, and hopefully, all like ten people rewatch it again, or whoever watched it. So maybe more this time. So we'll get right into it. This is an M1915 Adrian helmet, and this came out uh, out of a need to desperately create headgear, uh, head protection for the military, because most armies went into World War One. Pretty much all armies went into World War One without a helmet. They went in with standard like service caps, like cloth caps. And that proved in, you know, in battlefield conditions to not work out, especially in like modern war, where now the largest um thing that was causing casualties on the battlefield was artillery. And it wasn't even direct artillery cuz like most of the time artillery shells would either they would fall short of a trench or they would fall behind a trench and so I mean if a shell lands right in the trench next to you you're dead no matter if you have a helmet or not in World War One but uh, most of the shells would land uh, short or long of the trench and it would when they would hit they would throw tons of dirt and metal and fence posts and body parts and everything into the air and that would rain down onto the guys in the trench and that that was causing a lot of injuries and casualties was the fact that your cloth hat isn't going to protect you from you know 15 pounds of dirt hitting you on the top of the head and so they they desperately came up for uh a helmet and in late 1914 the french came up with um a design it was pretty ineffective but it was it was pretty much a steel bowl that you would wear on your head underneath your your kepi and this is this is the french uh standard kepi so this is this is a post-war kepi but this is still a still a french kepi so the construction is pretty much the same it's a wool kind of material and it's um they didn't offer any protection really and the the caps uh tended to slide off the steel bowls the steel bowls were very uncomfortable uh, they tended to heat up very uh, quickly. Uh, they also conducted cold too easily. So in the in the cold and in the rain, your head would get really cold really fast. So they decided to uh, uh, scrap that design. And in 1915, they pretty much copied uh, the at the time firefighter's helmet, and uh, that was made out of the same kind of four piece design uh, steel. And what it did was, is when firefighters would go into a building and let's say some of the building would collapse on them, the steel would kind of deflect the debris away from their head and their face. They could hopefully continue to do their job unless literally the whole building came down. And it was steel, so it was pretty good at radiating heat uh, away for short periods of time. But if you got into a building for too long, it would transfer that heat into your head. So the French essentially just took what they had because they were so desperate at the time. They, they just took this design and ran with it, the firefighter helmet. And uh, this one here is a Russian one, and you could tell because it has uh, the eight rivets around the sides, uh, rather than the the four sets of prongs. And I'll show you the prongs in like an early 1920s uh, M26 Adrian, which replaced the M1915. And the only difference between these two is they're pretty much the same shape, but uh, this one has the bill and uh, the uh, skirt in the back are riveted together and then they are held in with the seam to the shell and then the comb whereas the world war ii one is just all these pieces are the are one piece and then the comb is in a separate piece this is a reproduction badge on it by the way this isn't isn't original but this was under license by a ton of ton of armies in world war one uh the belgians used it the greeks used it the italians used it the russians used it uh, the Romanians used it, the Serbians used it, ton, tons of people used it, the Polish used it for a time, and it was it was a really, really uh, decent thing if there was nothing else. And a lot of countries couldn't afford to amp up and design their own helmet at a time when they're 
desperate just to find people. So, and you know, equip their armies for modern warfare the way it is, let alone try to design a new helmet and everything. So these are made out of, they're usually, you usually find M1915s without the liner, because uh, uh, a lot of times the little prongs have broken off or the liner has just rotted away because they're leather and wool and it just doesn't, stuff that doesn't stand, you know, the test of time for over a hundred years. And a lot of the helmets are even hard to find, just the shells, because they rust away because they were made out of a kind of inferior steel. So this is a very, a very, very thin steel. I don't know if you could tell because the camera's not zooming, but they're they're very thin, they're very light. This thing is like just, just over two pounds or just under two pounds. It's been a while since I measured it, but they're very, very light. And uh, this would, they dent very easily, they rusted very easily. Um, but it worked, so they they kept they kept with it. So in a lot of countries, kept with it. And the French uh, went in World War II. They kept the same same design. Now this is a World War II one, and this is a pretty standard example of one. This is one somebody tried to screw with, though. Uh, this is probably one that was made in like Yugoslavia or something like that. After that became a country under license. Because uh, some countries shied away from having the discs on the front like this one. This one has two little cuts to hold in this identifying badge on the front. Which every uh, different branch of the French army had and every other country that adopted the Adrian used a badge like this in World War I. But in World War II a lot of companies, uh, a lot of countries, sorry, went away from the badge because it compromised the shell of the helmet. Because the more holes you drill in the helmet is more weak spots in the helmet shell. So this was a Yugoslav one that somebody probably tried to pass off as a French one by punching these holes in it. As you can tell, the holes aren't lined up, and they're not the right way. The holes would have been horizontal and not vertical in an actual French one. I don't know why someone would want to do that, because the French ones are pretty cheap and they're readily available out there. But you can see the liner, the, the four sets of those little prongs. What you would do is you would bend these to stick through the liner and then you would bend them back and they would hold the liner in place. But the problem with that is it kept the liner so close to the shell and so when you got something would hit your head the helmet would essentially just bump against your head and it would still injure you. So what they did was is in early World War One, they put little corrugated pieces of aluminum or tin in between here and that just would provide like a crumple zone. The aluminum was thin and it would crunch rather than push all that force into your head so it would absorb some of the impact. Now, all the French World War II ones came in this kind of olive drab, whereas in the World War I ones, and here you can see they're kind of, uh, they came in a horizon blue, and the earlier ones were a lighter blue than this, and the later ones were a darker blue, and they were all blue, all right, unless they were made in another country, like all the Russian ones were blue, and then they were sent to Russia, and Russia repainted them this green or a tan color, a khaki, but they were all blue, the ones that were made in France. They were some shade of horizon blue. And the World War II ones are all this kind of olive gray color. Uh, you see some yellow ones for use in like North Africa by the Foreign Legion. The World War I ones too were uh, blue and then they were painted over brown or like a mustard yellow color for the Foreign Legion. And there's some examples of them on the Western Front and in North Africa in the colonies uh, at the time. But that is a um, typical World War II kind of look. Uh, then I'll show you a better example of the World War II one later. But first we'll talk about, this is what an early liner would have looked like. This is a reproduction liner, by the way. You're probably never going to find one this nice. But the early Adrian liners had crimson wool, because that was, at the time, uh, Horizon Blue hadn't quite become standard yet. And so a lot of uh, liners for the Adrian came in crimson, like uh, to match the pants and the hats and everything of the French at the time, because the French went into World War I wearing like a navy blue tunic and crimson red pants, which is why so many of them got killed at the, the Battle of uh, the Wilderness and stuff like that, because they, and the Battle of the Frontiers, sorry, not the Battle of the Wilderness, the Battle of the Frontiers, because they marched en masse, like Civil War style, into machine guns wearing bright red. Uh, so they were really easy to pick off and tons of fr French died that day. But uh, they, they came in this kind of red crimson wool. Uh, and this is a liner. Uh, it's kind of a pebbled 
And this is the early style seven tongue liner. They later went to a six tongue liner to ease the manufacturing process a little bit. And uh, it was pretty comfortable as far as this would go and that all the liners came in a bunch of different sizes and how you would adjust the sizes is you would pack more wool um, behind, the, behind the leather here. You would pack more wool behind here to make it fit tighter or looser depending on if you wanted to wear a winter hat under it or, or if you wanted just more padding or if it didn't fit right, you could adjust the fit by packing felt or wool behind, behind the tongues to make them fit better. And you would adjust the height here at the top by adjusting the tightness of this drawstring, which is just a piece of cotton. So, but we'll get this shell out of the way now and I'll show you a better example of the World War II one. And this is the, the World War II liner that's kind of standard. And what that is held on with is um, there's these kind of paddles, these green paddles held on with four little kind of tongues, kind of like a later uh, Russian design, like the SSH 68, uh, because it helps keep the liner away from uh, the shell of the helmet. And the, the uh, shell is then held on by these little clips that are just sewn right to the liner. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same liner, except this is the six tongue version, as you can tell. Uh, and the only difference is really they, it's still wool in the back, except it's brown wool now, or it came in a bunch of different colors and, um, yeah, black leather, six tongues, and they would clip to these little things and that would create an air cushion. See that? How it flexes real easy. Whereas on the World War One ones, you can't do that without crushing the aluminum spacers. So this, uh, provided a lot more protection. Uh, as far as impact goes, because it, it created an air pocket and the helmet shell was uh, movable from the liner. So it gave some, some, some give, essentially. And then it came with their standard kind of squared off buckled leather chin strap. And this is um, got the cover on it, the cotton cover. Uh, there's cotton covers in World War I and they came in pretty much every shade imaginable of brown and gray and green. And uh, this is kind of a khaki tan one. And in World War II, a lot of helmet covers were worn just to kind of uh, break up the, the shell. And you, I've seen ones with holes cut in them. I've seen homemade ones made out of uniform. This is just like a linen, cotton dyed tan. And it's just four little triangles sewn together. And it's held with like a shoestring, drawstring right there at the back that I have tucked under. It's just a really easy design to kind of break up the, the color and the look of the helmet. And you could smear this with dirt or white paint and stuff for the winter to help camouflage it even more but um the original uh adrian when it came out uh the french and the british kind of were shocked at the beginning because they they're like they started seeing the numbers after the helmets came out and uh injuries head injuries had gone up by 70 percent and the British and French governments are like, well, this is this isn't working. We just spent all this money developing these helmets and stuff to give give them to the troops and everything, and and now this is a total waste because all these all these hell, head injuries have gone gone up. Actually, we just we just there's no way we could see this coming and blah blah blah. And well, the reason the head injuries went up so greatly is because before the seventy percent of that increase in Head injuries were people that have died. Uh, so they were counted as killed instead of just injured. Uh, the 70% increase was because more people were living through head injuries. So that's why head injuries were going up is because the people before helmets would have been, a lot of those people would have been dead. So there, the injuries, the head injuries went up, but the deaths went down. So that means the helmet was doing its job. It was saving lives. And it took the it took a little while for the British and French to realize that, but right it's just a it's just a little fun fact that I find I find kind of hilarious. I mean, war is a, is a terribly terribly scary thing, and everything like that. But there there's some funny good moments you could take out of it. But so I think that'll pretty much pretty much wrap up the uh, look at the uh, Adrian family of helmets here. And uh, we'll just give you a comparison of everything that, that they went, uh, the family kind of went through. This is the, what they started with, the Kepi. And then in 1915, they went to this. And then in 1926, they went to this. So that will just kind of show you the evolution of the uh, French design here for the 
the Adrian helmet. And it's an excellent helmet. It's an iconic helmet. It's synonymous with France and tons of other countries. They still use this in ceremonial duties. And it's, it's an absolutely awesome helmet. I, I love it to death. I'm a huge fan of French helmets. I'm a huge fan of Russian helmets. I, I, love, I love helmets in general. I have almost 500 of them. I can't even keep all of them in my apartment. I have so many. So, but that'll pretty much wrap up wrap up this video for the helmets i hope this one is a big improved version compared to what you guys saw the other adrian helmet video too i got some more examples to show you and everything that i knew i missed when i was going through everything again so uh hopefully i'll like this video um leave a comment uh for anything you want to see next or just to show some appreciation and uh if you guys would be so kind as to give a shout out you know to me and some let your friends know that this is all here and everything, and I, I'm just doing this to get some information out there, but the information can't get out there if you guys don't spread it. So the more people to this channel, uh, the more the information is going to get out there, and it's. It, I hope I hope this will, will help some people down the road. Um, so I just want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.